that you've got to bring amazing profits and you've got this new international partner and they're wanting phenomenal profits. They're wanting 20% return on their investment in the economy that is 6%. There's no, there's no control there. What they've got is influence. All they can do is, is just hope, push and hope. So this is a very painful thing. and Many people experiencing this struggle through, through levels are experiencing pain. Okay, I want to just, I just want to give you a crystal clear message about the language. What's happening at the level of language? Level one, it centers on tangible concrete objects, techniques, and goals. If you're talking to someone at level one about anything bigger than the job, what this nut or bolt does, what this engine size does, they're just going to glaze over. Level two, remember the professional level, the service level, language centers on facts, on methods, on outcomes, and perhaps on practical theories. If you're talking surgeons, if you're talking professionals, if you're talking practical theories that can mean something today. Level three, best practice, language use is symbolic. Equipment and resources are less about what the thing does, it's about throughput and how it's going to change the, the workflow in the organization. Level four, symbolic language, talent pools, culture, values. The sort of stuff that if you lock this person and this person on a desert island, the language that they'll develop together will be this person's language. Because this person cannot hear this language. And of course it has no relevance on a desert island. <laughs> Level five, moving up to level seven, perhaps even level eight, language use is abstract. It's focused on intangibles, describes whole systems. Profit and loss is one, but I'm talking very abstract concepts of profit and loss. So as we start moving to a close, I want to, um, I want to bring your minds onto, onto a couple of practical things. What, we've described, what I've described is I've, I've described complexity. I've given you some case studies and or some real life examples and what I hope is those real life examples uh, just trigger in your own minds things you've come across and when you come across situations in future they'll trigger in your, in your own minds what you're facing because most organizational scientists don't have this frame of reference it's beyond typical organizational structure it's beyond typical HR it's beyond personality theory it's beyond normal cognition, the theory of cognition. It's a realm, this complex, the realm of complexity is a realm people don't know. And when you use it in your feedback or in managing subordinates or managing your, your seniors, when you use it, even if you don't use the language, you just use the concept, it brings a level of understanding into that conversation, which I guarantee you probably wasn't there before. So as I'm moving towards the conclusion, I want to reinforce a couple of things. I want to reinforce the levels. Um, I, I want to reinforce what's happening at the various levels. I want to reinforce the, the commitment to which part of the organization is being driven and what aspect of the organization is being driven at each of the levels. And then I want to end off with um, an idea of some trapdoors, the things that stop people from rising up and moving levels. And I want to also look at some open doors. Now when you're giving feedback, or when you're in your consulting roles, or when you're, when you're, when you're leading teams, the trap doors and the open doors are probably the most primary thing that you have to keep in mind. Elliot Jack says that you can move people, but the only vehicles you've got are coaching, mentoring, training, and selection. It's not hard. They're the only tools you've got. But what you do with those tools has got to be based on real understanding. So let's see if we can get to some of that understanding. How long do I have to wait till I can see the results of my decisions? This is a key feature. Level one, you're going to wait three hours to see what you've done come to fruition. At the very most, you're going to wait three months. I'm working in, I'm coaching uh, in a gaming company at the moment. I'm coaching a group of leaders in the gaming company. And um, I, I saw some uh, lights go off. 
<laughs> I believe we're offering a, 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 a gambling counseling service. <laughs> um, some of these people are building systems, are building processes, they're looking at what gaming will look like in years to come. Others are looking at transactional stuff. How many calls we're processing, uh, these are the leaders, so they're not actually the call center operators, but how many transactions we're, we're getting through, what training is needed. So if I'm a consultant in there, I'm talking three hours, that's my shift until tea time. They're my first targets. If I'm talking about the manager of the group of consultants, I'm, I'm trying to build up, um, dealing with one of the managers, she's thrilled because she's hit a target three months in a row. A target is 93% um, customer satisfaction of complaints or queries. 93% is a target. And she came off a base of 15% fulfillment against that target. So over the, over the past eight months, she's built up and now she's at 93. She's thrilled. And she's got a number of months left. And if she carries on hitting this target, then her bonus is in line. So 12 months for her is the time frame. But if I'm talking to the general manager of the operation, if I'm talking to the general manager of the operation, he should be talking, and he's not, but he should be talking, what are we doing one to two years in the future? Who are the competitors? What systems are they bringing in? What new systems are in development? What's happening here? We should be talking easily one to two years. And this is what it sounds like. You're saying, you know what, we're doing really well. I'm so thrilled that we're hitting 93%. All the signs are good but I'm concerned that we might not be able to hold this over the next 24 months. I'm concerned that if we don't get this project in and this project in, then in the last quarter, which is six months of this time frame, we, we could be hitting some rocky ground. You want to hear that language. And if you're coaching someone who's not giving you that language, you can encourage it by asking the questions and training them to start thinking in terms of those time frames. In London, where the executive sits, they should be talking, shouldn't they? They should be talking five years into the future. They should be saying, is gaming working five years in the future? There's a, there's a, there's a whole industry around the world of brass plate financial service organizations. So you run, you run your business and you have a, a, a head office in Malta or uh, Belize or somewhere in the world and it's really just a brass, brass plate on the door. And what it means is you get to pay tax in that environment. But now the world's changed, and suddenly that's not so kosher. And people are saying, yeah, we're not so sure about this, it feels dodgy. And although it's legal, big economies like Britain and the United States are starting to say, well, it's virtually illegal, isn't it? And they don't want to change the legislation, but they are starting to get a bit mean. So I'm coaching the chief executive of one of these organizations uh, in Malta, and he's, he's saying, James, I'm running a business in an industry which will not exist in five years' time. I employ 15 really great people with doctorates in all sorts of financial stuff, and what else should I do with them? What else can I do? How can I really find a business so that in five years' time, we're coming out of this with a brand new business that's legitimate and legal? Now, that's a, that's a wonderful thought. He's thinking five to 10 years into the future. He's thinking in vision, he's talking five years into the vision, in, into the future. And because he had the thought, he's now boiling it down to practical plans. What are we doing this year and next year? Okay. What's really interesting, and we, we, I'm talking about this as if it's logical. What's really interesting, you will meet people with very big business cards. who will confuse you because the language they use is down here. Just remember how people get promoted. They get promoted because they're tall, they're good looking, and they speak well. <laughs> That's how people get promoted. It <laughs> goes <Because> my career. <laughs> <laughs> what we're talking about here goes way beyond the normal prejudices that create careers. We're talking way beyond those prejudices. What we're talking about is real, muscular, what can this person do? Where is their focus? What are they looking? What, what is their capacity? All right, let's go from there. Let's not do this one. Oh, I just want to talk to you here. Um, so Omnicore started doing um, a whole lot of work for an organization locally called 
CARE. And uh, CARE was looking at HIV uh, support into um, underprivileged uh, communities. So we started providing them with all sorts of um, assessment work and coaching work and so on. And we got to go to the opening, the grand opening of the, the brand new care facility. And, and the, uh, what's the patron? The patron was Archbishop Desmond Tutu, is, I think, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So he was talking, and I thought what he said was original, but apparently it's not. But he was standing at the front, and if you've met him, he's, he's he, I don't know how he got a job. <laughs> but he may be good looking, but he's not very tall. <laughs> so he was standing up there. And he said, you know you've lived your life well when you come to the end of it and you find yourself planting trees under whose shade you will never get to sit. You find yourself planting trees under whose shade you'll never sit. And he was describing it as a life well lived. Now I don't think it's necessarily a life well lived like that for all of us. If you're on level one, maybe my trees are my grandchildren, or maybe my trees are my investments. But somewhere there's a tree, as, as, as we're maturing and as we're moving forward, there's a tree. And at this level, it starts to get more ambiguous, more vague, more esoteric. I just want to remind you, what are we focused on at each of the levels? What's your primary goal? At level one, your primary goal is quality. Your goal is to provide quality work. That's it. I just want to do a good job. And so at level one, it's a real causal way of thinking. This causes that. I know that because it's in the rule book. And if it's not in the rule book or on my computer screen, it's in the head of my boss who's sitting right next to me. Causal thinking is the, is the whole provider of structure at level one. At level two, we're focused on service, inside or outside. Service to your boss, service outside to a customer. My goal is to provide a professional product. I do my best work when I'm applying my specialist knowledge, my informal or my formal doctorate. I do my best work when I'm applying that knowledge in a known environment. At level three, best practice, remember the most vulnerable level. My goal is to create efficient systems for the business. It starts to become intangible. It takes a very high level of skill to make this level look solid and tangible. I do my best work when I'm aligning systems and processes to best practice benchmarks. I've got to be productive. I've got to sell people on the idea that I'm contributing, that I'm coming up with new ideas, that I'm pushing the organization forward. Level four, strategic execution. My goal here is to implement strategy and vision. I'm not necessarily making it. I'm making it happen. In the Effective Leader Index, we talk about building bridges of meaning. That's the key job of the strategic leader, is to build bridges of meaning between the grand strategy of the organization and what people end up doing every day. Here, we're describing that as a level four function. It doesn't have to be, but at its best, it's a level four function. I do my best work when I'm coordinating multiple systems delivering on strategic goals. And then here, we're looking at level five, Strategic formulation, and here my goal is to create the best strategy for the organization in a broad context, global context. All right. Let's just have a look at these. These are so clear. I thought of doing a slow reveal, <laughs> but I want you to look at all of it. So look at it and just get a sense of it. I'll read, but not so that you read, just so that we can slow the pace down so you can read it too. Trap doors, the things that stop people from rising up to levels. The busy drum, and I think this is number one. The world is full of people who go home every day and say, oh, I'm so busy, I haven't got a moment to think. I'm working at the moment with a, a person who's playing a level five role. He's the head of facilities for a worldwide organization. He's actually head of facilities for Europe, Middle East, Africa. And he's about to lose his job. He, I know that because he's telling me of all the politics he's, he's coming across. He's being, he's being attacked by his boss. He hasn't had an increase for a number of years. Um, he says he's doing a fabulous job, and he probably is, except his boss doesn't think so. 
so he's not. Um, he's about to lose his job. And as his coach, I once said to him, you're about to lose your job. I'm too busy to stop and think about it, he says. He says it in a million ways, and I don't think he's ever used that language, but I'm too busy to stop and think about the truck that's barreling down this hill and is about to hit me. The busy drama, I'd love to find the antidote for this. I think I'm gonna make it the rest of my career to try and find the antidote for the busy drama. <laughs> The next one is, and it's linked in there, is I mean, I will never say it because it's not cool, it's not politically correct to say that I'm needed. But people believe and they act in the belief that they are indispensable, that the organization will fall to pieces, or the customer will leave if they're not there any longer. It's a brilliant belief if you want to sabotage your ability to climb up through the ranks. It's brilliant. If you really if you're really in charge of IT, a brilliant way of making sure that if you're lucky and 95, you can still be in charge of exactly the same systems. Because if you believe you're indispensable, you can never train anybody else because they're not as good as me. You can never look sideways for new training and move into new areas because I can't leave my desk. You never go and leave, and therefore you die of a heart attack. Too young. <laughs> Linked into this is detail to death. It's about people who cannot look at the big picture even if they're desperate. They cannot look at a situation except into the detail. Strategy doesn't happen in the detail. Strategy starts off with a bigger view. And you've got to be able to relinquish your hold on the micro detail even if it's just for a morning or even if it's just for one shower. You've got to be able to relinquish your hold on the micro detail. The detail is the stuff that tells you why stuff can't happen. So Richard Branson is having a shower one day, and he thinks, I know, let's build Virgin Galactic. Let's take people into space. <laughs> I guarantee he didn't do that whilst he was thinking of his cash flow, or whether, whether the materials exist, or whether Galileo has got a booking system that will suffice. <laughs> he wasn't doing that. He went to the boardroom and said, okay guys, 20 years time, I want tourists in space. <laughs> Strategy doesn't happen at the level of detail. We have to carve out a space for thinking to happen. Detail can always fill it later. The fear of failure is, I mean, we talk about it, and we talk about it glibly. In coaching, I think the fear of failure comes up and smacks people in the face time and time again, and it looks like a million different things. But people's reluctance to try something new, to challenge a boss, to see things the way their boss is likely to be seeing it. When, when you ask someone in coaching, tell me the same story, but now through your boss's mouth. It's impossible. People physically cannot do it, because they're afraid of seeing objectively what it looks like when they are failing. They can't tell you what their boss is thinking, I mean, some can, but they cannot repeat the story they just told you through their boss's mouth, because they'll probably come off badly. The fear of failure is massive. And in feedback, and in building structures, and organizational science that we're involved in, it's a critical area. And then there's this generalized fear. So it's not just the fear of failure, it's fear of everything. You cannot grow complexity. You cannot let go of control if you're scared of everything. You can't. I'm watching an amazing story at the moment of a brilliant man, brilliant man, who could change the world. But he's too scared of going out and being public and being seen. Too, he's just too scared of who knows what what people might say, what, what dirt might be dug up on him from years gone by, who knows? Well, there's just this general sense of the world is not my friend, it's my enemy. It cripples people's ability to grow up in complexity. And then we mustn't forget this. And it comes back to attribution theory. And it talks about it's impossible to grow your own level of play in an organization where the structures are disabling you. It's it's impossible to succeed fluidly. It's not impossible to try. 
I love working with people who say, I am talented, but this organization won't let me show my talent. Because that has to be rubbish. You know, talent will out. But what we're talking about here is systemic, structural prison that some organizations create that prevent people from growing up and moving into higher levels of complexity. Remember, one of the key issues around moving into complexity is about letting go of control. Organizations say we want our leaders to emerge, but at the same time, if they're punishing people for making mistakes, leaders aren't going to emerge. Complexity is not going to emerge. Now, that's on the negative side, and we'll find that lots. Everyone you coach, everyone you work with, everyone you give feedback to, everyone you assess, everyone you manage, you will find a whole array of these. The open doors are, let's remember, Jack's cognitive power. The open door is if this person is bright, and if it's a brightness based on flexibility and, and openness to ideas, and this sort of malleable intelligence that we spoke of, you can do something. It's my, my phrase. I, I love to work with people who are experiencing a personal state quake. So a personal state, and it's an earthquake of that state. So the management team I spoke about in that retail company, they were experiencing a personal state quake. They were mid-40s, and they realized that if they didn't pull this together, and change the level at which they were managing that company. Remember, they were all benchmarked to them one, two, and one, and three. If they didn't change, they would all lose their jobs. Not because they were being threatened, but because that was the writing on the wall. They would be losing their jobs. So they created a state quake. And if you look at people who leave organizations and become entrepreneurs and do amazing things, it's because somehow inside themselves they've built a personal state quake. They, they have made themselves so uncomfortable with their present reality that they have no choice other than to get out and defeat the fear and to climb up, start climbing up. There's another thing here, and it's linked to it, and it's threshold pressure. Now, this is not necessarily personal. It's a bit like a personal state quake, but it's a personal, it's a threshold pressure. And it's a pressure, perhaps, of the environment is putting so much pressure on you. Uh, we had in in uh, 1994, no, 1997, eight, when, when we started Omnicorp, one of our first um, big areas of business was franchising. Franchising was booming because government uh, was retrenching thousands and thousands of white government employees and giving them big packages and saying, we no longer want you, go forth. And what they were going forth into, where, what do you do? You go and buy a franchise. And these people had been pushed beyond the threshold. They hadn't had a personal state quake. They hadn't woken up and said, I want to go and do something brand new. But they'd reached a threshold in their lives where the past was no longer viable. And they had to move forward. It wasn't necessarily a personal draw. It was a reality for them that the, the environment had shifted. Our role in that, just for a bit of history, our role in that was to help those people not to lose their money by aligning them with the right franchise for their skills. Small recognized victories. Now, if you're the boss, if you're the person giving feedback, if you're the coach, this is your book. Everyone has shown, everyone has shown skills in the past which look like victories of complexity. They may not actually be victories of complexity, but you can reframe them as victories of complexity. So someone, someone stops drinking and uh, when, they were, when they were 23, the, the, th the person you're seeing today is 35. When they were 23, they stopped drinking and they started to hold down their first job properly for, the, for six years. You can reframe that, that victory as a stepping stone on the path to complexity. You can reframe it as a winning time in the person's life. And the more of those experiences they have of what you're talking about, of what complexity looks like, complexity is about learning apprenticeship. When you stopped drinking and committed to your job for six years, you learned, you did your apprenticeship, you learned your skills. It's a fundamental building block of starting to develop. You're starting to build this confidence and you're starting to build people's imagination of what a more complex future could look like. Let's be practical. 
a more complex future for the salesman who stopped drinking when they were 23. A more complex future could be that one day she could be sales manager. That's the complex future. She says, I can't do it. You say, yes, you can. Kathy had the most beautiful experience of coaching a woman who wanted um, to play internationally in the field of finance, but hadn't got the degree. Uh, she had lots of experience, hadn't got the degree, and didn't package herself in any way that looked like an executive. So over a period of time, and using techniques like this one, saying, what have you succeeded at in the past? Not, not quite as bluntly as that but finding evidence in this person's life of when they had succeeded and when they had broken out of the mold they felt had been assigned to them. This woman is now working in Chicago for, for a very large organization, um, having moved from South Africa to Chicago as global head of, of this aspect of that organization's finance. She changed the way she looked. She had surgery on a leaking eye, on an eye that uh, wouldn't stop weeping. She packaged herself differently, and she started in her mind to reframe her talents, her skills, and she started to present herself differently in the office, so differently that a year later, after the coaching began, after she started seeing these victories, a year later she was promoted to Chicago. Stuff is so powerful. Reflections of potential, and it's a very similar thing. One of the, one of, one of the ways coaching works and I think one of the powerful gifts we have when we're giving feedback, one of the powerful gifts managers have when they're looking at people and saying, this, is your, this could be your future, is reflecting their potential. Many people grow up not able to hear anything good about themselves. And I think it's our role to reflect practically the building blocks of complexity, wisdom, knowledge and skills, cognitive power, values alignment. If we reflect practically at those levels and remind people that these are the building blocks for future complexity, what a gift that, what a gift that is. And then finally, sustained encouragement. This is not an event. This is not an event. You can't do this in a three-day training course. This is a walk side-by-side -side process. So the, when we're giving feedback or when we're, when we're working with someone on a short-term basis, there probably is a benefit we can add. But if we can get into a relationship where we're going to see that person over a period of time, and let's look at what we're talking about. The team that changed, the team that changed its levels, that was, I think, a three or four year process. Um, Adrian, who told me he wanted to leave his organization and go back to be his chief financial uh, CFO. That was about eight years before he, or six, uh, between six and eight years before he discovered success. This is a lengthy process of sustained focus on rising up through the levels. So, where are we? What I've, what I've told you is that this thing exists. Complexity exists. It exists as a theory, a very obscure theory, um, given out to the world by Elliot Jacks who had an unfortunately belligerent style. And I think one of the reasons it didn't stick in the world is because he has that unfortunate style of taking everybody on. And if you read articles and if you read about conference papers he delivered, he was aggressive. And the reason this hasn't stuck is because he couldn't build disciples. The truth is, this stuff is magnificent. It makes a profound difference in the lives of the organizations we work with and, and, and with our clients. So, there are practical ways in, and the thing for us, the practical ways in come through working with the cognitive power, the knowledge, the skills, the values, and that issue of temperament. That's our practical step. This stuff makes sense. It works beautifully. I hope you can use it. Brilliant. Thank you.